Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's August 15th. Today, we remember the man who helped to establish the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And we'll also learn about the Swedish botanist who specialized in mycology. We'll salute the American botanist who wrote The Calendarian, a marvelous phenological record. And we'll also recognize a fanciful botanical illustrator who anthropomorphized flowers in his book. And we'll also honor a husband and wife team who created a magnificent arboretum in the middle of the country. And we'll celebrate National Relaxation Day today with a poem that celebrates a feature that most gardeners would love to have in their gardens, a little running brook. And we'll grow that garden library with a book that's all about the little things that we put in our homes to make it extra cozy and personal. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a man who created the term ecosystem. And his words still challenge us to see our gardens through a much bigger lens. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world and today's curated news. Well, today I wanted to start out by sharing a garden feature that was shared in the Facebook group for the show. This was a photo that was shared by Mary Klein, and it was of one of her rain swales. You know, I don't know about you guys, but up here in Minnesota, we've been getting tons of rain and we need it. So that's the upside. And if you'd like to create a feature in your garden that will help your garden process rainwater more efficiently, you should really consider a swale. Now, the picture that Mary shared of the one in her garden is a perfect example. And if you'd like to see it, the next time you're in the Facebook group for the show, just type in swale and Mary's picture will pop up. Now, in case you're having a hard time imagining what a swale is, just imagine a dry riverbed. And I always think of swales as being paisley shaped, but they don't have to be. Now, if you have natural low spots in your garden, that might be the perfect place to install a swale. Just follow the contours of your garden and use the swale to help you direct rainwater. And another benefit of installing a swale is that they filter runoff, and that's very important. Now, you can have all kinds of fun landscaping around your swale. You can install plants that like wet feet in the deeper areas of the swale or along the sides. And generally speaking, native plants or even prairie plants feel especially at home in fast draining soil. So all along the edge of the swale is a perfect opportunity to try out some new plants in your landscape. Now, the main thing to keep in mind if you're interested in installing a swale is that the purpose of the swale is to slow down the water and to make sure more of it gets into your garden. So imagine you have a hillside garden. Well, they're perfect for swales. Or, as I mentioned earlier, imagine you have some low spots in your garden. Well, you're going to save yourself some digging because essentially if you have to start on a flat surface with a swale, you're essentially digging a trench or a ditch. So wisely working with the contours of your garden is a good thing to do with a swale. Finally, if you're looking for some swale inspiration, don't forget to check out Pinterest or even Instagram. There are so many images nowadays of beautiful swales in the garden. And I'm confident if you do your homework, you'll find your inspiration from some of those images. All right, that's it for today's Gardener Greetings. Now, if you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment, all you need to do is join the Facebook group for the show 
or you can send me an email with your garden pictures, your stories, your birthday wishes, and so forth. And my email is jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. Here's today's curated news. This is a piece from Connecticut Public Radio, and they featured the ground cherry. Here's an excerpt. Some vegetables are just fun, and we've been growing ground cherries for years. This tomato family vegetable looks like a mini version of a tomatillo. It's a sprawling two-foot plant that produces an abundance of green turning to brown papery husks. And inside the husk is the fun part. Small cherry-sized fruits mature from green to golden. Unwrap the husk, harvest, and snack on the fruits. And they taste like a cross between a tomato and a pineapple. They're sweet and delicious and something kids really love. Now, I was talking to Patricia Newport at the start of the summer because I accidentally bought some ground cherries on one of my first trips to the garden center. And I was a little worried because I know that ground cherries are a bit of a commitment. Once you have them, you probably will have them for years in your garden because they self-seed themselves. But I decided to give it a go, in part because my mom made this passing comment about how Grandma had them in her garden. And then, on the other hand, I had a friend talk about how much she and her kids enjoy harvesting and eating ground cherries. Anyway, this post from Connecticut Public Radio does a very good job of introducing you to the ground cherry. So if you'd like to check it out, all you need to do is search for the word ground in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop up. Well, today on the blog, I reshared a post that I wrote last year, and it was all about the turmoil that my garden went through after having our shingles and our siding replaced. And guess what? I'm about to go through it again up here at the cabin. In fact, we just had the roof done. I was so impressed they got it done in one day. And in about six weeks, we'll be going through the entire process again getting new siding on the cabin here. And that's something we desperately need to do because the woodpeckers up here are something else. And they have pecked baseball-sized holes in the back of our house. They're relentless. In any case, I'm very excited to get it done, but I'm not so excited about all of the trauma that my garden will go through. So rereading this post from last year, was a great reminder to me. Anyway, I thought you'd enjoy hearing an excerpt from this post. Here goes. I always remind new gardeners that we never garden alone. We garden in partnership with Mother Nature, and in this partnership, Mother Nature will have her way. Now, sometimes we may feel like we win, But I kind of think it's like the first time you play Go Fish or some other game with your kid. They just think they won. In any case, I'm using all of this chaos as an opportunity to address some crowding in my garden beds. And in some places, after the terrible storm came through, everything is just gone. And I suppose I could also see it as an early start on fall cleanup. The one thing I'm grateful for is the replacement of this very large 14 by 20 foot arbor that's on the side of our house. Now initially, I had started growing several different varieties of clematis on it. But then I switched and settled on golden hops when I was going through my hops phase. Well, over the past few years, I've decided I'm not a fan of hops on this arbor. The vines are aggressive and sticky, and the sap can be irritating to the skin. And I wasn't a massive fan of the color either. 
because I chose golden hops and they just didn't go with the siding on the house. Now my student gardeners are going to come and help me cover the area with some landscape fabric because I think that's what it's going to take to keep the hops away. They are vigorous. And then after a season of rest, I think I'll go back to one of my all-time favorite shady climbers, the climbing hydrangea. Now they're slow growing and it's going to take a while for them to get established, but once they do, man, are they pretty. And if you think hydrangeas make you swoon, wait till you see a wall of climbing hydrangea. It's scrumptious. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out any of my curated news articles or original blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it in the listener community for the show on Facebook. It's called the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community up in the search bar where you'd look for a friend. And then once the community pops up, just request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the Austrian naturalist and botanist, Karl von Schreibers, who was born on this day in 1775. Now, the Austrian Empire had a special affinity for plants and horticulture, and they funded expeditions regularly to collect new materials for their natural history museum. Many famous botanists were involved in these expeditions, including Carl Philip von Martinus. Now, in 1806, Carl von Schreiber became the director of the museum. And although he was an excellent botanist and ecologist, his heart belonged to minerals and meteorites. One of Carl's smartest moves was to make Leopold Tradenick the curator of the Museum Herbarium, which was founded in 1807. And for over 40 years, Carl grew the museum. And then, sadly, things took a bad turn. In 1848, during the Revolution in Vienna, the Natural History Museum caught on fire. Protesters not only destroyed the library that Carl had carefully built, but they also destroyed Carl's home, since his living quarters were right inside the museum. The destruction of the museum was too much for Carl. It broke his heart. Carl immediately retired, and he died four years later. And today is the birthday of the botanist Elias Magnus Fries, who was born on this day in Sweden in 1794. Now, the area where Elias grew up in Sweden was rich in fungi, and as luck would have it, his father was a self-taught botanist put those two things together, and it's no wonder that Elias Fries developed a lifelong interest in mycology. In fact, Elias developed the very first system that was used to classify fungi, so we remember him for that. And if you Google Elias Fries, you'll see there's a wonderful picture of him as an octogenarian, If you're a Harry Potter fan, Elias looks like he could have been Dumbledore's best friend. Elias was a happy botanist, and he worked tirelessly until the day he died in February 1878. And today is the birthday of the American botanist John Torrey, who was born on this day in 1796. John was the very first American botanist to study the flora of New York State. 
And the area that John botanized included what is now Greenwich Village, the area of the Elgin Botanic Garden, which is now Rockefeller Center, and Bloomingdale, which is now the Upper West Side of Manhattan, as well as Hoboken, New Jersey. Now, one of the things we remember most about John Tory is his calendarian, which was his phenological record, where he documented his plants. He recorded the species, the location they were planted in, and the date of their first bloom. It was kind of like a baby book for his plants. Well, historically speaking, farmers have often kept similar records so that they can track their planting seasons and growing cycles. And Thomas Jefferson did the same thing as John Tory in a book he called The Calendar. Now, if you'd like to see John Tory's Calendarian, and it's really fascinating to look at, I've put a link to it in today's show notes. Because the New York Botanic Garden has digitized this manuscript, so you really should check it out if you get the chance. And here's a fun little piece of trivia about John Torrey. The mountain known as Torrey's Peak in Colorado is named for John Torrey. And today is the birthday of the illustrator Walter Crane, who was born in Liverpool on this day in 1845. Today, gardeners fondly recall Walter thanks to one of his most stunning works, a book called A Floral Fantasy in an Old English Garden. It was published in 1899. Walter's book was actually intended to be a children's book, but as I like to say, it became a beloved book by children of all ages. For gardeners, it's really something of a graphic novel telling the story of the secret life and society of flowers. In Walter's world, the flowers are personified. For example, the dandelion is portrayed as a bold knight. His shield is made of a large dandelion blossom. And the foxgloves are a lively group. They're comprised of cousins and brothers and sisters. Today, Walter's book continues to appeal thanks to his beautiful artwork and the allure of the enchanted realm that he created, complete with fairies, the four seasons, old man time, knights, and other creatures. Now, there are 46 illustrations in Walter's book, and original copies of this book are very rare, and they sell for over $1,000. But luckily for you, you can view Walter's entire album for free using the link in today's show notes. And finally, today is the birthday of the co-founder of the Bickelhaupt Arboretum, Robert Earl Bickelhaupt, who was born on this day in 1914. Robert and his wife, Frances, created an arboretum around their family home in Clinton, Iowa. During the 1960s and 1970s, Robert and Frances watched as Dutch elm disease claimed the beautiful elm-lined streets in Clinton. In response, they began planting a diverse range of trees on their own property, which was 10 acres. Now, Robert and Francis were exceptionally disciplined when it came to planting trees on their property. They grouped all of their trees by species. And today, the Bickelhaupt Arboretum has a lovely collection of trees, including ash, beech, birch, crabapple, elm, hickory, honey locust, linden, magnolia, and oak. And they also have a very beautiful conifer collection, which is regarded as the crown jewel of the arboretum, and it features many rare and dwarf conifers. In total, the Bickelhaupt Arboretum boasts over 2,000 different species of plants. 
And just this week, the Bickle Helped Arboretum is writing a new chapter. They're cleaning up the damage from the derecho, the widespread and severe windstorm that blew through the Midwest earlier this week on Monday. Now, as a result of the derecho, the Bickle Helped Arboretum lost 28 trees and many more were damaged in the hurricane force winds. Now, the first course of action for them is cleanup, and then they'll have to take down trees that need to be addressed immediately because they've been so compromised. In any case, it's truly a new chapter for the Arboretum. And if you happen to go to the Bickelhaupt Arboretum, there's a poignant sculpture of Robert and Francis near the entrance. They're standing side by side as Frances places one foot on a shovel that she's holding in front of her. I love that sculpture. In unearthed words, today is National Relaxation Day. So take a deep breath and imagine the movement of water as you listen to the words in today's poem. Here's The Brook by the British poet Alfred Lord Tennyson. I come from haunts of coot and hern. I make a sudden sally and sparkle out among the fern to bicker down a valley. By thirty hills I hurry down or slip between the ridges. By twenty thorps a little town and half a hundred bridges. Till last by Philip's farm, I flow to join the brimming river. For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. I chatter over stony ways in little sharps and trebles. I bubble into eddying bays. I babble on the pebbles. With many a curve, my banks I fret by many a field and fallow, and many a fairy foreland set with willow weed and mallow. I chatter, chatter as I flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. I wind about and in and out with here a blossom sailing, and here and there a lusty trout, and here and there a grayling, and here and there a foamy flake upon me as I travel, with many a silvery water break above the golden gravel, and draw them all along and flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. I steal by lawns and grassy plots. I slide by hazel covers. I move the sweet forget-me-nots that grow for happy lovers. I slip, I slide, I gloom, I glance among my skimming swallows. I make the netted sunbeam dance against my sandy shallows. I murmur under moon and stars in brambly wildernesses. I linger by my shingly bars. I loiter round my cresses. And out again I curve and flow to join the brimming river. For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book. It's The Little Things by Susanna Salk. This book came out in 2016, and the subtitle is Creating Big Moments in Your Home Through the Stylish Small Stuff. This is one of my favorite books. I love the botanically themed cover. And here's what Quintessence Blog said about Susanna's book. 
Susanna successfully celebrates those details in our homes where we express ourselves the most and where our memories, our personality, and our style come alive. And then here's what Vogue said about Susanna's book. If the walls of your home could talk, what would they say about you? Turns out, a lot. That's the message in Susanna Salk's new book, It's the Little Things. Susanna details how the smallest design elements have the potential to make the biggest statements. And I guess that's what I personally love about Susanna's book, because she incorporates so many natural elements. She brings the outside in, and that's something gardeners love to do in their homes. Now, just because we enjoy doing that or we want to do that doesn't mean that we're doing it effectively or to the level that we want. And that's where Susanna's book comes in because it is chock full of inspiration. And Ballard Designs said this about Susanna's book. If you've ever struggled with how to decorate your mantle, how to create an arrangement on a wall, or how to create a moment in a small space, this lushly photographed volume is a godsend. This book is 272 pages of little stylish things that will create meaningful moments in your home. You can get a copy of It's the Little Things by Susanna Salk and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $38. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the English botanist and pioneer in the science of ecology, Sir Arthur George Tansley, who was born on this day in 1871. Arthur's father had a close friend and fellow teacher who was also a botanist, and it was this person who inspired Arthur to pursue botany. From a legacy standpoint, Arthur is remembered for creating the botany publication New Phytologist, which was named after an 1842 publication called The Phytologist. So Arthur's journal was The New Phytologist. With his journal, Arthur wanted British botanists to be able to communicate and discuss their teaching and research. And it's thanks to Arthur Tansley that we embrace the concept of an ecosystem. He introduced us to the term in 1935. Arthur defined an ecosystem as a community of organisms that interact with each other and with their environments by competing and collaborating over the available resources in order to thrive. In doing so, they co-evolve and jointly adapt to external influences. And listen to this quote by Arthur Tansley and see if it doesn't challenge you to think about your plants, your garden, and your world more broadly. Arthur said, The whole method of science is to isolate systems for the purpose of study, whether it be a solar system, a planet, a climatic region, a plant or an animal community, an individual organism, an organic molecule, or an atom. Actually, the systems that we isolate mentally are not only included as part of larger ones, but they also overlap, interlock, and interact with one another. Isolation is artificial. Now, with that in mind, when we ask ourselves as a gardener, what's wrong with this leaf, or with this flower, or this shrub or tree, etc., we should probably be thinking more broadly, what's going on with this garden, with this lake that I'm gardening by, with this community that I'm living in, with this land. 
We honor Arthur Tansley every time we think bigger, every time we remember that our gardens are part of a bigger ecosystem. Today, the new phytologist gives the Tansley Medal to early career researchers working in the field of plant sciences. The award is intended to increase visibility for the exciting work going on in all areas of plant science. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.